morning and welcome to this Kepler Trust Intelligent Alternatives for Income event. This week we're running a series of webcasts with managers of trusts offering different solutions for those seeking a different income. Shortly we'll be hearing from Reese Davies, manager of Invesco Bond Income Plus. This is a trust with circa 240 million in total assets and an attractive historic dividend yield of 6.4%, currently trading on a small discount. Yields on fixed income have obviously become more attractive this year, which may be making the asset class look more attractive in comparison to alternatives than in previous years. While Reese speaks, please put your questions to him using the function that should be on the right of your screen. Uh, we'll collect those and put them to him at the end of his presentation. Over to you, Reese. Great, thank you, Thomas. Um, so. Hopefully, I've now got control of the presentation. Um, yeah, so uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to uh, tune in and watch this. Uh, as Thomas said, my name is Rhys Davis. I'm the manager of Invesco Bond Income Plus, um, which is an investment trust with the ticker BIPS on the London Stock Exchange. So I'll refer to the fund as BIPS. It's going to be a lot easier. Um, we titled this presentation, as you can see, delivering a steady income in an uncertain world. It's actually a title we put together for a presentation last year, but I think um, it's far more meaningful in the current in, uh, market environment that we have. So uh, standard disclaimers on this page. Um, a little more about myself. I'm uh, based in the Helion Thames office at Invesco. My background is as a credit analyst, which is the Bond equivalent of an equity analyst, but unlike an equity analyst who's always looking for a company's story, as credit analysts, we really worry about the credit risks of lending to that company. Uh, and I also manage our monthly income plus fund, that is a 2.2 billion pound sterling, 2.2 billion pound open ended fund with a, a, a similar income focus to BIPs, but managed in a different way. So uh, for the next half an hour or so, I'm going to talk about um, high yield bonds, which is the main investment focus of BIPs. And whilst they haven't offered particularly high yields for a while, uh, they're certainly offering a lot more yield now. And so I'll talk about why they're a good place if you're looking for steady income. Then a little bit about the market. Uh, and as you know, this year has been a, a, a terrible year, terrible start to the year for financial markets, whether it's equities or bonds of any type. And then onto the fund itself and why, uh, why we think it's a very nice product for investors looking for that steady income stream over the long term, or maybe for those who want to rely on returns from income during more volatile uh, times like this. So onto the next page. Um, First of all, why are bonds considered so useful when you want that steady, reliable income? Um, I'm sure everyone is aware of this, but the main point really is around that coupon. So when compared to equities, a bond pays that pre-agreed rate of interest, that coupon every year. It's a contractual obligation, so unlike a dividend on an equity. Uh, and the second key point is around ranking. So a bond is simply a loan to a company or to a government. And because of that, it ranks above an equity if things go wrong in a business. The trade off is that the upside on a bond is uh, limited, whereas equities, of course, in theory, offer an unlimited upside, all of which gives equities and bonds that different appeal for a different part of your portfolio. So with that in mind, to the next page, um, with that in mind, what do I mean when I say that BIPs invests in high yield bonds? Well, technically, a high yield bond is defined as such by its credit rating. So as, in, as bond investors, we like to categorise bonds according to their level of credit risk, the credit risk in lending to that borrower. In other words, what are the chances of me uh, not getting my money back from company X? And so the rating agencies like S&P and Moody's created the ratings that you see here that simply rank that risk from extremely low AAA through to uh, be careful, triple C. Uh, and then those get split into these two broad groups. So anything are rated double B and below is called high yield. Anything above that is called investment growth. 
and then the yields and bonds increase the further down the risk spectrum they are. So a single B rated bond yields more than a double B, et cetera. So as I say, technically it's the rating that defines whether a bond is called high yield. And for some time now with central banks uh, doing what they've been doing for so many years, high yield bonds have often not been very high yielding. But as Thomas pointed out at the start, that has really changed this year. So in Europe, the high yield index currently yields around 5.9% on a yield to maturity. At the start of the year, it was only 3.4%. So we've seen a really dramatic move already just over the first uh, four and a half months. Um, I think perhaps the most important point to make on this slide, though, is that when we're making investment decisions at Invesco and we're deciding whether to buy a bond, we will take note of what the rating agencies have to say, but it's very important that uh, we understand those credit risks and that we form our own views. So we have a team of analysts who do just that. That's also my background. Um, and then the, the, the final point I would make here is what are um, what are high bonds not? It's a, it's, a, it's an odd way to phrase it, but I think it's quite important in today's environment. They're not the same as government bonds or, or investment grade bonds, both of which are far more sensitive to movements in interest rates. And that has been a big issue for bonds this year. Uh, and although, as I say, um, this year has been a, a bad year for bonds of all types, it is government bonds and investment grade bonds that have seen the greatest declines in price. And when investors become nervous about rising interest rates, as, as they have been this year, they're generally right to be nervous about bonds, because when yields go up, bond prices go down. But I would say that higher bonds are less exposed to interest rate risks. They're not immune to them by any means, but they're typically less sensitive uh, because the coupons are higher and the maturities tend to be shorter. So what we as fund managers do need to focus on with high yield bonds, however, are those credit risks. So they are really at the very core of how BIPs is managed. Moving on to the next page, uh, some examples of high yield bonds, just to give you uh, an idea of the types of names that are high yield issuers. On here we have Ford, M&S, Rolls-Royce. All three were impacted by COVID in various ways. All three, as a result, were downgraded from investment grade to high yield. And we refer to that as fallen angels. Uh, and actually, they only went from investment grade to double B. So that first level rating or rating that we refer to as high yield. For us as a team with a lot of experience investing in high yield bonds, suddenly having companies like that trading as high yield and suddenly offering much greater levels of yield was very exciting. Um, now, I don't want to downplay the challenges that those companies faced during COVID, but they gave us some attractive opportunities. So Rolls-Royce, for example, then went on to issue bonds with a seven year maturity, meaning they must be repaid in seven years time, paying five and three quarter percent. Uh, and given shareholders had supported the business with the rights issue, we found those Rolls Royce bonds a really attractive uh, bond to be putting into this portfolio. Uh, in fact, all of the all five of the companies on the top row of, of these examples are fallen angels that were investment grade and are now high yield. And, and they can often be a great investment, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for a portfolio like this once they've fallen down into the high yield category. You'll also see ASDA um, on this list. This is a more typical example of when a company issues a bond that is a high yield bond at the start of its life. So ASDA, ASDA spent the past 20 years or so as part of the Walmart group. Uh, last year, they were acquired by private equity group TDR alongside the ISSA brothers. Uh, the ISSA brothers set up the EG petrol station in the UK. Uh, those petrol stations that have um, Greggs or subways attached to them. So to fund the acquisition of ASDA, TDR and the ISSA brothers uh, used a lot of debt, including high yield bonds. The secured um, high yield bond tranche was rated double B and the unsecured were rated uh, single B to reflect those credit risks of, of lending to ASDA. The coupon on the secureds was three and a quarter percent and on the unsecured it was four percent. But since then, because of the changes in the market, uh, also because of the changes to the risks that ASDA faces with uh, rising input price inflation, rising energy costs, a weaker pound, among many other factors, 
those bonds today are yielding over twice their original yield. So for BIPs, we weren't hugely excited by Asda's bonds a year ago at three and a quarter percent, and we didn't buy those bonds for the portfolio, but at over 7% today, they're offering a lot more yield and they look far more attractive for an income seeking fund like BIPs. Uh, obviously, you know, we have to understand the credit risks and we have to make sure we're comfortable with those. Uh, another example on this page, um, a company like Virgin Media, they've been a, a, a high yield bond issuer for years. It's a unique business in the UK with its cable network. It's a very nice business for bondholders as a result. It's, it's, it is rated quite highly for high, for high yield bond, a double B. Uh, and today, with more yield available everywhere, their bond that matures in 2030 is actually yielding, uh, well, it almost got to a yield of, of 7% last week. So the portfolio is, um, is constructed, it's built up with, with bonds from lots of different high yield issues like those. Crucially, the, 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 um, the commonality is these are companies that we can rely on to keep paying those coupons so that BIPs can then pay that income out to its shareholders on a quarterly basis. Uh, of course, it's never as straightforward as that all the time, and sometimes companies do fail on that contractual obligation. So I've included here Pizza Express. Some of you may be surprised to know that Pizza Express went through a debt restructuring in 2020. Um, they could no longer afford their debt. And, and whilst COVID uh, and lockdowns really pushed them over the edge, they had been looking vulnerable vulnerable before the pandemic, essentially just too much debt on the balance sheet. Pizza Express at the time had um, two bonds, one of those ranked senior, but investors in their 200 million pound junior bond were essentially wiped out, so their claim was worthless, whereas the senior bondholders walked away as the new, ship, new shareholders. If you owned those junior bonds, it was a very bad outcome. Um, and then as it happens, after that, a new Pizza Express returned to the hired market with uh, a much lower debt burden, so have not been through that restructuring, which means that they that more of the cash that the company makes can then be put back into things like renovating their restaurants. If you've been to a Pizza Express restaurant recently, um, you probably would think that it, it could do with a renovation. Um, so we were happy to be lending to the, the new Pizza Express uh, company with the, that new balance sheet, new debt burden um, at a coupon of six and three quarter percent for five years. So as high fund managers with um, those kinds of risks that we also need to manage, there are a couple of ways that we handle the credit risks of the companies we invest in. The first is uh, we have in the team a very experienced uh, team of credit analysts who spend each day reassessing the credit risks of the companies that the, whose bonds we own. For example, our view on old Pizza Express was that the company had um, heightened credit risks before the pandemic, and so we'd sold those bonds going into the pandemic. So those analysts are looking at cash flows, uh, operating performance, uh, the balance sheets, obviously, of, of the companies that we're investing in, and also, um, really importantly, trying to actually sit down with the management team of Pizza Express or Asda or Virgin Media. So sit down with the management teams of the companies that we invest in. The second important way that we manage those risks is a, a really very simple principle, it's through diversification. Uh, and by that, I mean BIPs will typically have bonds from well over hundred different companies. So shareholders are investing in a portfolio that is uh, you know, focused on the high market, but is very diverse of, uh, in, in terms of access to those different high yield issuers. So that if we do have a Pizza Express in the portfolio, the damage is somewhat mitigated. It, it is a different way of constructing a portfolio than you would with equities. And that's simply because equities and bonds do have those risk, uh, different risk return profiles. So going back to the, the, the slide at the very start. Um, Moving on to the uh, market then, I've already mentioned um, where yields are today. We've had this very rapid move higher in yields in the higher bond market. So we're just under 6% in Europe uh, as of today, a little bit more in the US. And you can see that from this chart, looking at yields over the past uh, uh, what are we, seven years, 
putting that brief period in 2020 to one side um, with the pandemic, um, it has been several years since we've had yields like this in our markets. And if you've seen me present over the past few years, I've mainly been complaining about that fact. So it is a good time to find some yield. We are excited about that. Uh, the reason, though, for this rapid move higher in yields this year centres around inflation uh, and concerns over central banks raising interest rates to try and tame it. On top of that, of course, they've also been and are in the process of withdrawing some of those huge amounts of stimulus that they provided more recently. Um, the invasion of Ukraine uh, has certainly only worsened some of those issues as well. So what we do have this year is yields rising on government bonds leading to yields rising on higher bonds. And now, uh, unfortunately, we also have to be thinking about the potential risks that lie ahead, uh, including, unfortunately, the possibility of recession. So for BIPs, um, the way that we're constructing the portfolio today, that means keeping the portfolio still quite cautiously positioned in this market, um, also investing less in bonds that have a long time to maturity. And then, as we always do, really focusing on uh, the credit analysis of the companies we invest in. But as I say, there is more yield in the market and we are adding some of that yield back into the portfolios, which is a great opportunity at the moment. Um, on to the next page. Um, these two charts are, are just making the point that it has been a very challenging year uh, in the higher bond market, that even a company such as Virgin Media, um, which we regard as high quality, good for bondholders. We like it very much in the portfolio and we feel we understand their credit risks. Uh, and ultimately, we are confident that the bonds that we hold will be repaid in full. We can't see any, uh, any material risks to that assessment at the moment. The price on their longer dated bonds, nevertheless, has still fallen almost 18% this year to around 82 at the lows. Um, that's happened as markets have repriced to higher yields. And the longer that a bond has to maturity, this is a 2030 bond, um, the more exposed it is to price declines. The second example here is a price chart for Daimler trucks. And this bond uh, was actually only issued in December of last year, December 21, at a price of par or 100. So uh, bonds are typically issued at a price of 100. And um, today that trades coincidentally um, at a price of also around 82. It's a double B, uh, sorry, triple B plus. Um, so it's an investment grade bond. It's a very good business. It's got strong margins, um, BMW type margins. Um, and about two thirds of the price decline that you can see on this chart is because government bond yields have risen and the rest reflects a change in how the market is pricing the credit risk of Daimler trucks. So th the bottom line um, from those two charts and, and from looking at the market is, as I say, there is more yield today for some bonds, especially those with the longer maturities. Um, it has been a painful process to get here, but there is now more yield available, which is great if you're investing for income. Uh, and the BIPs portfolio is set up to make the most of that for its shareholders and then to pay that yield out as quarterly dividends. On to the next page, um, excuse me. Uh, here's another example of the impact of uh, duration or rate sensitivity on bonds. So, and um, whilst higher bonds generally have less duration than investment grade bonds and are less sensitive to rising rates, those that do have more duration have really been thrown around this year. And this is a price chart for two of Telecom Italia's, uh, Telecom Italia's bonds. One of them has a short dated maturity of 2024. The other is a much longer dated bond that doesn't mature until um, 2038. That longer dated bond has a lot more duration as measured by a calculation called modified duration. Uh, modified duration basically says for a 1% move in yields higher or lower, what do you expect the price to do? Uh, and you can see for that bond, it's it's, it's around 9.77. So that would be a 9.77% price decline uh, if, if yields have risen by 1%. So as measured by modified duration, you can see uh, the 2038 bond has much, much higher um, rate sensitivity. 
and the light blue line on this chart for that bond shows far more price volatility as a result. Indeed, this year it's fallen by about 30% in price. There is another element to the story for Telecom Italia uh, in that it, it, it is or it has become the target of a potential takeover. That, that was a story earlier in the year. Normally, takeovers are great news for an equity, but for a bond, it can be the opposite. Um, high bonds do typically have some legal protections against that, but this particular bond doesn't because it began its life as an investment grade bond. It's a fallen angel. Um, but really, you can see the impact of the longer duration of that bond uh, this year with both um, government bonds trading off and also sp spread widening because of that story around the takeover. On to the next page, quite a nice way um, here of outlining to investors the potential impact of duration, not to um, labour the point too much especially if you don't spend every day looking at the bond market like we do. Um, it, it's useful to consider the impact of a rise in rates on a government bond. In this case, we've chosen UK gilts to, to make the point. So on the left, you can see the yield that you can earn on a gilt today uh, for a bond with a maturity of five years, 10 years, 30 years, uh, still only a 2.1% yield today for a 30 year gilt. And then the impact of a uh, 50 basis points or half a percent move higher in yields and then a, uh, the impact of a 1% move higher. So for a, a shorter duration, five year maturity gilt, a 1% move higher in yield sees a 4.9% decline in price. And then obviously by the time you get out to a 2030, uh, sorry, a 30 year maturity, it's a lot more. So it's over a 20% price movement for the equivalent yield move. Uh, and for high bonds, the impact of rising yields um, is less linear than that. But as I mentioned, they're still not immune. We have seen that this year. But what high bonds do offer, though, is, is more income. So a high bond can recover some of those losses quicker through the income that they earn. Uh, and that's a very nice feature. Um, so for BIPs coming into the year, thinking about duration, because of concerns over the potential for yields to rise, duration on the portfolio was relatively low. It was around 3.5. And then looking ahead, we're keeping the portfolio duration still at a relatively low level, so a similar level today. Um, so it just move on to the next page. Yeah. So it hasn't been an easy year for high bond markets. One of the indicators of health and healthy functioning that I like to point to is the new issuance market. So the supply of new bonds into the market. And uh, this table on the right hand side, you can see 2021 was a record year for that. So we had 150 billion euros of issuance in Europe. After redemption of bonds through maturities and uh, being called by companies, that was a net supply of uh, 88 billion. So again, a record. This year, though, that picture has has dramatically changed. So we've had very low issuance and virtually none uh, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The reason for that is investment banks don't like to bring companies to the market to issue bonds when there is volatility because it makes it very hard to reassure a company and the treasurer of the company about what level their coupon will be set at. And if you're a seasoned high yield issuer, say a double B rated company that has several bonds outstanding, you don't want to issue a company, uh, a coupon, say, uh, today that might be 2% um, higher than where you could have issued just six months ago. Especially if that could then mean that your existing bonds have to adjust down in price as a result of that. You've just made, if you do that, you've just made your entire debt stack more expensive to fund in the future. Um, and also what we did see last year with this record issuance was many companies coming to the market to issue bonds into a strong market and in many cases uh, getting ahead of their refinancing needs. So meaning that they're not under a lot of pressure today to issue. Um, but for those that are, um, uh, coming in to, to try and issue in this market is going to be tricky. So uh, we have an example here of one of the um, only companies that's issued in the last um, three months in, in Europe in the high market. Uh, 
Miller Homes, they didn't have the luxury of waiting for the market to calm down uh, for, for better conditions. And for them, it turned, it turned into quite a costly experience having to issue a bond into a weak market like this. Um, and essentially, one of the things that we're quite excited about looking forward is companies having to pay higher coupons when issuance uh, does return to the market. So when companies are returning to the market to issue bonds. For too many years now, what we've seen in the higher bond market is companies uh, issuing bonds with lower and lower coupons. And that does make it harder for a fund like BIPs, which is really after high income, but also from uh, good quality companies. Uh, so this example, Miller Homes, it's a company that we've known um, since their first bond deal in 2017. They're a large privately owned UK home builder. They're not in London or the Southeast, um, uh, which I think works in their favor right now in this environment. Uh, they make family homes uh, using a standard template um, that they can roll out in different developments and they're big enough to get economies of scale on costs, et cetera. So we've known the company for um, a good five years. We really like the company. Their first bond deal, as you can see on the left, came in a, a strong market with a five and a half percent coupon um, and it was uh, double B rated. Whereas their second bond deal, which was issued last month, was rated one notch, one notch lower at B plus, um, but it came with a seven percent coupon. But crucially there, um, and we haven't put it on this slide, we, we probably should have made sure it was on there to, to make it clearer, but crucially, that bond was issued at a large discount on day one. So it was it came in a price of 93.45, uh, which meant that on day one, it yielded eight and a quarter percent. So if that bond had been issued in January, I, I reckon it probably could have been priced at six and a quarter percent. Um, rather than eight and a quarter percent yield. So it's cost the company about 200 basis points more by coming to issue in a, in a weaker market. Um, and as I say, we're, we're quite excited to see good companies having to pay more to bondholders through higher coupons. And when the new issuance market does reopen, um, that's what companies will have to do. That's typically what, what happens during periods of market weakness when the the high, the, um, the new issuance market in high yield does close. Um, and we'd really like to see a resetting higher of the levels of coupons that, that um, companies are having to issue bonds at. Just moving on to the uh, next page. Um, sorry, that was the Miller example. Moving on to the uh, next page, defaults. Um, I've touched upon the subject of defaults with Pizza Express. It's a very important factor when investing in higher bond markets. It's the reason that we place so much emphasis on our credit analysis and also why we maintain that good diversification of companies that BIPs is invested in. This chart um, includes forecasts for default rates uh, in the higher bond market um, from Moody's, which is one of the rating agencies. Financial forecasting is impossible to get right. It's not something I ever want to have a go at. And actually the forecast that Moody's made back in April of 2020, um, you know, the, the height of the pandemic concerns, proved to be wildly wrong because of the actions of governments and central banks to help companies. But as a general sense of the outlook um, that, the, that Moody's are capturing here with their forecast, I don't disagree with this chart. I, I think higher companies, as I, as I mentioned, have been very good at making the most of the cheap funding that's been available. And so maturities have been pushed further and further out into the future. Uh, and so the potential pressures of having to refinance in a more challenging environment have also been pushed out into the future. Um, so for now, at least, there isn't anything of major concern uh, for us around the, the default outlook. But of course, that can change fairly rapidly. So um, that brings me on to uh, an outlook for markets and, and summing up some of the points that I've made. There are risks today, uh, and I would say there are more risks uh, than a year ago, whether that be ongoing inflation pressures, 
and subsequent interest rate rises that, that go beyond what the markets are currently pricing in, or the potential for central banks to go too far or for the rising cost to put too much pressure on consumers and the economic growth. So we're still in that phase, I would say, where a degree of caution is warranted. And we've certainly not seen the um, riskiest parts of the high bond market um, really repricing to levels of yield that are saying uh, the market is really worried about the future. And, and for us, with those concerns, um, that's a part of the market that we're not particularly interested in investing in at the moment. There are plenty of good opportunities at the, at the better quality end, the double B rated part of the market right now. Names like Virgin Media, for example, that are repriced to very attractive looking outright yields. Um, so caution is warranted right now. That's how the BIPs portfolio is being managed. Um, but as, as I say, the, the good news is for income investors, there are more income opportunities. It's a good opportunity to really add some income back into portfolios, which we have been doing. And then in the next phase, um, which could be very good news ultimately in the long run, is when high yield issuers come to the market with a new bond, if they pay a high coupon that we've been seeing bonds being issued at for some time, that's going to be really good. Um, so moving on to the um, the final section, the trust itself, and why myself and uh, Ed Craven, who's the trust's deputy manager, think it's a very nice product for investors looking for that steady income stream over the, the long term. First of all, BIPS was um, actually formed a year ago now through the combination of uh, City Merchants High Yield and Investor Enhanced Income. They were two investment trusts that we had managed in the team for many years and which I have managed uh, since 2014 initially as a co-manager. The result is the largest investment trust in the AIC uh, loan and bond sector. I mentioned diversification as being very important. Right now, trust uh, the trust owns uh, 195 issuers, uh, as in different companies, so spreading that risk around. The trust can borrow. It's a common feature on investment trusts and a very important distinguishing feature against an open-ended mutual fund. The ability to use borrowing in a careful and controlled manner, I think, can be a very powerful tool. There are limits in place um, and they're set at 30% of gross, gross asset value. Today, uh, the trust is around 16% of uh, borrowed on a net asset value basis. Uh, and essentially, the way that we use the borrowing is to buy more of the quality bonds that we like. So to allow BIPs to maintain that attractive level of dividend to shareholders without having to buy the riskiest bonds out there to earn that high level of yield. You, using the gearing to do that is something we have a, a long track record of doing in the team with the predecessor trusts, which goes back to um, uh, the uh, start of the uh, the, the century. Uh, and, and 2020 was really a good, as good a test as you can get in terms of managing a fund with uh, borrowing during a very rapidly falling market. Um, finally, uh, on this page, on the dividend, there is a, st a stated target of 11 pence per annum for the first three years after the merger. That is to give shareholders that certainty of income during this period. And uh, today that equates to dividend yield of around, uh, I think it's 6.6% .6%, um, uh, based on today's share price. And as you would expect, with more yield available today uh, than a year ago, when the board decided on that lengthy target, um, that figure is actually, that LMP figure is actually much better covered than we thought it would be. So that's really good news from uh, from the trust's uh, perspective. I would also point out that BIPS uh, does currently trade on a small discount to its net asset value, uh, which means investors are able to buy the shares for around 4% less than their market value. So to sum up, um, by carefully choosing the bonds to invest in and using some borrowing, BIPS is able to offer a relatively high level of income to shareholders who are looking for steady income. Um, and then 
Finally, uh, here is the team. Uh, you can see a lot of industry experience, which is the numbers in brackets, uh, and some happy looking faces. So uh, thank you very much for tuning in. I see Thomas has appeared on my screen, so uh, I look forward to taking your questions. Thanks very much, Rhys. Um, yeah, we do have uh, 10 minutes or so for questions. So we have a few that have come in, but please, if you're in the audience, um, keep your questions coming. Uh, you touched a bit on default rates, Rhys. How does the default record in the portfolio compare to the high yield index? Yeah, it is um, it is a very tricky one to, uh, to pin down. Um, it's a very good question. Um, and we've had it from in, from shareholders over the years and so for the last couple of years in the annual report we've tried to really lay it out uh, in terms of defaults within the portfolio um, the reason it is tricky is a default doesn't necessarily for us mean um, uh, a bad outcome going back to that slide at the start um, you know, a, a bondholder is is in a more senior position um, and Going back to the Peter Express example, the bond, the senior bondholders there became the shareholders. So there is a there is a a part of the high yield market called distressed investing, where investors um, will look to buy bonds that are trading at distress levels. So where a default is likely, distressed price is typically something around forty uh, pence on the pound, cents on the dollar. Um, and uh, buying bonds at that level. Um, thinking about working with a company to go through a restructuring to take ownership of the company on the other side uh, with say maybe a, a longer term view a two to three year view uh, where we would expect to get a much better eventual outcome than the 40 cents that we've invested in so within the portfolio of course there will be some companies uh, that we own that then things start to go wrong so operationally suddenly uh, you know, things have gone very wrong for them. Um, it could be a fire in a factory, it could be you know, all sorts of things, um, you know, just poorly managed, sometimes fraud. The credit analyst um, obviously will be monitoring uh, companies very closely. They will be flagging that to portfolio managers. And as, that's, as, as those situations evolve, we'll be making a decision. Do we want to exit this? Because we think that we could sell them at a price of X today. Um, and uh, we think that's probably fair value if there is a, a default and a restructuring, or do we want to be adding to that position? Or is it a bond that we don't own in the portfolios that we actually think is a good opportunity? So going back to 2020, um, there were a, a handful of uh, bonds that we were buying, some of those that we didn't have in the portfolio, that we were then buying at distress levels during that period of, of real market weakness in March and April, with a view to then go through a restructuring with them and come out the other side. One of those, to give an example, one of those was a company called Petra Diamonds, a, a, a diamond miner. Um, they had listed equity. Bondholders ended up taking ownership of most of that listed equity in exchange for a haircut on the bond, so in exchange for a reduction on our, on our, on our bond. Um, but the, the, the net result in old bond terms is that we've got to something like a, a 90 cent recovery on bonds that we were picking up from the portfolios at a price of 40 or, or at, I think down to a low, of, low 30s. So we try to lay that out in the annual report for investors to see how we approach default. Um, and I, yeah, I, I apologise that there isn't a nice clear answer to that but I think the key point really is that we're, we're active managers so we do try you know, obviously we are every day thinking about those risks trying to manage those risks making decisions around companies that maybe things are starting to go wrong do we exit them or do we add to them so that, so that's the the benefit of an active manager I would, I would point to and, and staying with default so you mentioned the general picture in the market how, what's the situation in either, so energy intensive industries, do you, do you view these as potentially being at risk of default? But then also on the other side, I think energy producers tend, tend to um, ordinarily um, pay higher yields. Yeah, are there opportunities in the bonds of those companies than where maybe they're 
economics suddenly look a lot better over the next few years? Yeah, um, I mean, there aren't a huge, in Europe, there aren't a huge amount of um, oil and gas companies in the hybrid market. It, it, it's a much bigger part of the US hybrid market and um, uh, viewers might be familiar with what happened in 2014-15 when the oil price collapsed and the, the shale producers, which is where a lot of that issuance in the US hybrid market uh, got to. So um, it is a much higher risk part of the market, but uh, those bonds that we do have in the portfolio have done very well in the energy space. And you're correct, energy intensive companies um, uh, yeah, have been hit. Uh, companies that are very exposed to, to rising input costs and are, are struggling to pass those on or will struggle to pass those on, they've been hit already. So a lot of that is already reflected in the market. And we are, you know, we are always reassessing our view of the credit risks versus the yield that's on offer for a bond. So if it, if, if it is starting to offer a lot more yield, and we think that it's a company that you know, will get through this and there are some levers they can pull, et cetera, um, then it might start to look quite attractive. But right now I'm generally more wary of um, retail names, um, uh, auto suppliers, for example, they they typically have a very hard time passing through costs if they're not a, especially if they're not a, a, a tier one auto supplier. Um, the the auto manufacturers typically have all the the levers there. Um, uh, and, and we've seen some casualties as well, um, where bonds have, have traded down to stressed, getting closer to distress levels. Um, there was an Italian paper manufacturer uh, that hadn't hedged their energy costs um, and then Russia invaded Ukraine, gas prices shot through the roof. Italy is very exposed to um, uh, Russian gas, uh, to, to gas costs and, and Russian gas supplies. And so they, they turned around within a, a week or so and said, we've had to shut our factory because we simply cannot, um, there's no point us operating. We're paying more in gas than than we can sell our product for. Um, and those bonds tanked in price, as you would expect. They, they have recovered since then because the company has, has um, received some assistance and the situation looks a little bit better for them. But, um, but yeah, lots of factors for us to think about right now. Um, and generally comfortable in those names that are beneficiaries and, uh, and, and have performed better relative to the market. Um, and less comfortable about you know, the um, the outlook for those names that are really in the thick of things as we stand at the moment. And especially, go back to the point I made in the summing up, especially those um, weaker, lower quality um, uh, companies. So the, the weaker single Bs, the triple Cs, C rated to kind of frame where they sit in terms of risk. Um, those companies, the bonds of those companies, we haven't seen the real repricing to high yields that we would typically expect to see uh, in, in a really weak market. So that may still be to come. So that's why I, I, yeah, I've made the point that we are, caution, caution is still warranted at this point. Um, but the great thing is that we're seeing this repricing across the board, meaning that I, I can pick up Virgin Media for almost 7% yield. Um, which I'm very happy to do. So some some attractive outright yields in the market right now because of the the, the speed at which um, yields have repriced higher this year. We've had a couple of questions maybe around the remit of the trust. So if I could, if I could wrap them together. So what flexibility do you have to go outside of uh, say UK European high yield? Can you look at emerging markets and would you? Can you look at equity where the yield is higher than, than the bond and would you do that? Can you look at floating rate bonds and, and would you do that? Yeah, um, let me start with the, the last one. So floating rate um, uh, is, is a small part of the um, higher bond market. I guess um, you, you have to look at it from the company's perspective. Um, uh, you know, if, if we're thinking of it from a, a from an investor perspective, and we're thinking about the potential for rising rates, floating rates are fantastic. Floating rate bonds are fantastic because they don't have that rate sensitivity. It's 
the coupon will adjust higher as rates are moving higher. Um, the flip side applies to the company. They're thinking about their funding costs, and if it means that their funding costs could rise in a rising rate environment, they may be less inclined uh, to issue a floating rate note. They will do if there is uh, you know, a lot of demand for them. Uh, and also, um, uh, you know, a, a treasurer can hedge some of those risks as well. But typically, there's a, a very small part of the market is floating rate. So I, I think it's around 6% in the European high yield market. I'm not, not sure what it is in the US. Um, so when we can buy floating rate notes and when we like the credit, crucially, then we will do. Um, but what we've also seen is that in, in the high market, some of those floating rate notes haven't necessarily held up in price. So um, you'd think they would you know, hang around that par level. But obviously, as the you know, if the credit um, outlook for that company changes, or if the general outlook uh, of economic outlook changes, then you might see those bonds trade down. And we've seen that in, in a lot of cases. So you've lost some of the benefit of the floating rate. Um, leverage loans is an area that uh, in theory we, we could um, do more within the trust. And that is something we're exploring. Uh, leverage loans are all floating rate and they are typically uh, require the same skill set to analyze as, as higher bonds. So we have that skill set. Um, and it's something that we can you know, we can explore for the trust. We can manage duration in other ways. We can manage rate sensitivity in other ways. We can use um, uh, you can use futures. You can sell government bond futures. So effectively, you're selling government bonds to bring down the, the duration, the rate sensitivity in a portfolio. So that is another tool in the toolkit that we have. And um, we didn't use it this year because the duration was relatively low on the portfolio anyway. Uh, and, and making income, yeah, I'm making them remit. Uh, market, I think. with the bond oh, yeah, that picture has changed because there is so much more yield available in our market um and then i can't remember what was the first uh emerging markets oh emerging markets yeah uh, which we do um so typically around five percent um maybe going up to to around 10 percent if, if we thought there was really some value there uh, and we have a uh, a dedicated uh, emerging market fund manager in the team and uh, an analyst that works with him and then our, our macro analyst also works with within that team um, so we do have the resources in the team um, again it's about um, comparing what we can get in europe us uh, developed markets high yield with emerging markets. And, and sometimes um, we can access you know, very big, um, co good quality emerging markets that offer a decent yield uh, that stacks up very well against a developed market. The issue, of course, is you then have those additional risks on top. So there's the political risk, the currency risk, um, et cetera. Um, so it is something we can do and it's, it's, it's another tool and we are currently using that within the uh, Thanks very much, Reese. I'm, I'm aware we've um, run over our time. Uh, there's a, there is a question from the floor about, about the charges, which I can answer from, from the fact sheet. So the latest ongoing charges are 0.85%. Um, thanks very much, Reese, for your time. And thank you for to the participants for your, for your questions and your interest. Um, we will hopefully see you tomorrow when we will be hearing from the managers of International Biotechnology Trust. But thanks very much, Reese, and I hope hope you all have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.